You guys ready to dive into God's Word? Yeah. Awesome. Well, before we do that, somebody just gave me our first donation of the year for Lives of Legacy. So come here, Jeremy. Somebody just handed me $100 for Lives of Legacy. So uh, that's awesome. Let's keep it going. So the reason I showed this video is because we are in our series, Growing Things Change, right? So God wants us to be growing. If we're healthy, we're going to grow. But growth is not enough. We also want to change. One of the best illustrations that I can think of transformation is a butterfly. Because it starts out as a caterpillar like we were watching in the video. And over time it becomes a butterfly. But how, is it, how does it do that? Well, a couple of the things that the video showed us is that one of the first things that a butterfly has to do is when it's a caterpillar, it has to eat a lot, right? So as followers of Jesus, we want to be spiritually hungry. We want to be hungry for the word. We want to be hungry for fellowship. We want to be hungry for prayer. We want to be hungry for serving the Lord because the more we eat, the more it prepares us for that transformation. But then another thing that the video revealed is that when the butterfly goes inside of this cocoon and begins to change, it actually dissolves, right? So there's this process of dying to self that has to happen. We cannot remain who we were if we hope to change to become more like Jesus. And then after that dissolving process, after that dying to self, the butterfly begins to reform and be reshaped and remolded. And when it breaks out of that cocoon, it has wings and now it's time to fly. And you guys ready to start flying with Jesus? Yes. yes. All right. So growing things change part two. How many of you guys remember your first vehicle? Anybody remember your first vehicle? I'm going to put a picture up on the screen. Uh, this is not my first one, but this is what my first vehicle looked like. That is a 1984 Ford pickup. It was pretty sweet. It had a nice little 302 V8, a short wheelbase, chrome wheels, was black with a little red pinstripe down the side. Now, the truck was as old as I was, but it was a great truck for a starter. The only problem is, is that it had this really weird electrical issue. Some mornings when I'd be driving into town, it would just suddenly lose power when I was going 55 miles an hour down the road. The problem with that is I grew up in the country on a very hilly and windy, narrow country road. So um, have you ever driven a vehicle that lost power steering? Anybody? Like you have to have like Popeye forearms just to keep it between the lines. It's very, very scary. So I realized um, that my will, like my own will, my desire, is a lot like losing power steering in a car. Um, when I keep the Holy Spirit in control of things in my life, I stay between the lines pretty easily. But if I take hold of the steering wheel myself, it takes everything I have in me to keep myself out of the ditch. And sometimes I still go in. In Matthew chapter 16, 24, Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but you lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? That's the question, right? What would you trade your soul for? So, have you ever seen the movie Let, or the show Let's Play a Deal? Anybody? Let's Make a Deal? Okay, what did I say? Play a Deal? All right, let's make a deal. I even have it correctly in my notes. All right, so let me ask, um, I'm going to ask Big Al because he's loud enough for everybody to hear. All right, Big Al, I will trade you 40 hours of work this week for $2,000. Will you take that deal? Yep, I would too. That's $50 an hour, not too bad. All right, check this out. I will trade you a remodeled 2,500 square foot house, two nice vehicles, a boat and RV, quality education for kids, and a good retirement, and all you have to do is give me 100,000 hours of your life over the next 40 years. Will you trade, take that deal? Absolutely, that's a good deal, right? So let me give you this one. Here's, here's, the, here's the hook. I will give you the entire world. And I mean everything, anything that you might want for as long as you live. But all you have to do is give me your soul for eternity. You going to give me that deal? No, absolutely not. Why? Because it's not worth it. 
If you're going to make a deal, it has to be worth it. You have to be getting better than what you're giving, or at least come out equal, right? So the point Jesus is making here is you can have everything that you could ask for, everything that you could have and want in this life, maybe 100, 120 years tops, and you can have everything, the best life imaginable, but is it worth your soul? And the answer is always no. But the problem is that the enemy's deals are not usually that obvious or simple. It usually comes along in the form of something like, okay, would you rather have a fancier car and just not spend as much time with your kids? Or how about you trade an hour of passion for your marriage and your family? Or in my case, will that candy bar actually be able to fix the problem that you're, hap- that you're having? Jesus shows us what it looks like to be willing to surrender our will to the Father. Because that's really what it's all about. If you want change, if you truly want to be transformed and to become more like Jesus, you have to be willing to surrender your will. Last week, we talked about the importance of surrendering our emotions and our heart. Well, the will is just as important. In Matthew chapter 26, we're actually going to talk about the the story that Sarah just talked about in the Garden of Gethsemane. It says, when Jesus went with his disciples to the olive grove called Gethsemane, he said, sit here while I go over there to pray. He took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he became anguished and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little further, bowed with his face to the ground, praying, my father. If it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Submitting our will to God isn't easy because it creates inner turmoil, even in Jesus. Now, some of the turmoil that Jesus was facing was that he was beginning to experience the weight of all human sin. And it said that he was under so much stress on his will that his body was actually beginning to manifest symptoms. The capillaries in his body were bursting and blood was actually pouring forth out of his veins. He was so stressed out. But another part of this was simply his humanity. Jesus was just as human as you and I are. The difference in his humanity is that he was perfect and without sin and we struggle. So we're going to have even a greater fight with our insides. We're going to have an even greater fight against our flesh when we're trying to submit our will to the Father. But look at what Jesus says. He says, Father, not my will, not what I want, not what's convenient or easy for me, not what's going to make me happy right now. I'm not in it for the instant gratification. You do what's going to be best for me and for everyone else. The reason that we face this inner inner turmoil and laying down our will to God is because two-thirds of us is still a work in progress. When you get saved, your spirit is perfected by Jesus. Your spirit comes into perfect alignment. You are, you are reconciled with the Father. Yet relationship is reestablished. But your soul which is your mind, your will, and your emotions, and your physical body, they are still a work in progress. They are going through this lifelong process called sanctification. So don't beat yourself up if submitting your will all the time is not easy. Because look at the rest of the story. In Matthew chapter 26, 40 through 44, it said, then he returned to his disciples and he found them asleep. He said to Peter, couldn't you keep watch with me even for one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. Listen to this. For the spirit is willing because your spirit's been perfected, but the body, it's weak. Then Jesus left for a second time and prayed, my father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. When he returned to them again, he found them sleeping for they couldn't keep their eyes open. So he went a third time, prayed, saying the same things. If Jesus, the Son of God, empowered by the Holy Spirit, the perfect 
the perfect example of the Father on earth, if Jesus has to pray three times to get his will laid down, how many times do you think you're going to have to pray? How big of a struggle do you think it's going to be for you? So stop buying into the lie that just because you don't want to do everything's God's way, that you're not walking with Jesus. It takes time to get there. Now, one of the important things, though, that Jesus did not do here is he did not keep a back door open. A lot of us like to live our lives with this, with this spiritual trap door that we can have an exit whenever we want. We'll walk along and we'll say, okay, God, your will be done unless I don't really like it. And then we allow ourselves an out. You know, Jesus had an out here. Do you remember Matthew chapter 4 when he was tempted by the devil? In Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 through 9, it says, Next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain, showed him all of the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And Satan said, I will give it all to you if you will kneel down and worship me. You see, Jesus had an out. All he had to do was kneel down and worship Satan, something that would have taken less than a minute, and he could have had all of the authority, all the honor and glory given to him. He could have owned the world but you know what he would have given up in exchange for it? You. Me. We would have remained eternally separated from the Father. We would have experienced hell. So Jesus was not willing to trade your soul or mine for the world. If Jesus wasn't willing to trade our soul for the world, why in the world would we be willing to do that? We have to be so careful not to keep a back door or an alternate open in our minds because the devil will allow that all day. Satan wants you to think, okay, you know what? I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to walk with Jesus. And then if it doesn't go my way, if it gets too hard or if it's not convenient or easy, you know what? I can always go back to the plan B. There is no plan B. There's only Jesus. There's only one way. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 40 through 44, I'm sorry. Let me give you an example. So uh, this week, I just had one of those weeks. Do you ever have one of those weeks? Yeah? I know some of you had one this week because we've been talking. I had a very difficult time getting my will to line up with God's. First of all, um, I've been a little tired. My, our youngest daughter has decided just not to sleep at night. And so, and that means, and you know if you have small children, that you're not going to sleep well at night. Now, I get up like once every seven times that my wife does, but I still feel worse for me than I do for her. Um, second, my routine has been off a little bit. I've had some early morning meetings, and it just kind of threw me off. So that's, that always messes with my head when my schedule gets out of sync. Third, I've been stressed out because I've got a couple of really big papers to write for, uh, for one of my theology classes that I'm in. And so that's always fun. All those of you in school say amen, because you know that, that stress. And then um, fourth, as I was leaving the gym one morning, I got an awesome text message from my wife. And I mean, of course, all of her text messages were awesome, but this one was just really special. Um, it said, hey, babe, just so you know, the sink is backing up into the dishwasher and it's pouring out all over the floor. Oh, and by the way, um, our basement bathroom's flooded because the toilet's leaking. So uh, have a good day. Love you. <laughs> right? And that was great news to me because with all the other stuff I have going on, it was just something I was really looking forward to, calling a plumber to come and then pay him to come and, and work on this. It, I just, I had so much extra time in my week. That was, I was so excited to do that. Right in that moment, a thought hit me. Man, I miss donuts. <laughs> Seriously, that was the thought. And I just thought I could really go for a half dozen donuts, some chocolate milk, a little mindless TV, and a nap. Like, that's what I want. And you know what? That would have been my exit from God's plan. That would have been my trap door. That was the trap door that I kept open for 18 years. And that temptation came up out of nowhere when I was at my weakest. In Matthew chapter 21, 28 through 31, I love this story. Because this parable illustrates that this is not an easy thing, laying down our will to the Father. And there's a right way to do it. There's, a, there's an actual honest way that's probably going to work. And then there's a way that's going to cause us a lot of problems. Matthew 21, 28. What do you think about this? 
A man with two sons told his older boy, son, go out and work in the vineyard today. I want to pause. God has work for you to do in his vineyard. You know where God's vineyard is? Wherever you're walking, wherever you're going, that is God's vineyard because you take the kingdom of heaven with you wherever you go because the Holy Spirit of God lives inside of you. And God has work for you to do. Let's keep going. The son answered, nope, I won't go. But later he changed his mind and went anyway. So the son's initial response was, I don't got time for this. I'm too busy. I got to call a plumber. I got this going on. Um, Life is difficult right now. And he just says, no. But then something happens. I believe the Holy Spirit began to deal with him. Because if you notice, he's called a son. So he's already a son of the father. This is a story about Christians. This isn't Christians versus non-Christians. This is talking specifically about children of God. So the first child is probably a lot like us. The first instinct, the first reaction to a lot of what God asks us is no, can't do it, not going to do it, not interested in doing it, going to do my own thing. And then the Holy Spirit stirs and we change our mind. And by changing our mind, what it means is that we submit our will to the will of the Father. Then he goes to the next son. And he says, I want you to go. And that son says, yes, sir, I'm on it. I will do it. But he doesn't go. Which of the two obeyed his father? And they replied, well, the first one did. And that's absolutely right. The first son obeyed even though his initial reaction was wrong. But his heart was open. He did not allow himself to be controlled by his feelings. He was allowing the Holy Spirit to guide and direct his life. And he was willing to change his mind, which is a big part of the process of submitting our will to God, where we come to this place where we realize that his way is better than our way. And we're going to be better off doing what he's asking us to do instead of us just doing whatever we feel like doing. The second son terrifies me because I think that the second son is a much better representation of the church today. Do you want to serve the Lord? Heck yeah, sign me up. Now this is not not meant to be a drive-by guilting, okay? But I'm just going to use an example. Two months ago, we, uh, we cast some vision for keeping kids safe at Word of Life. And we said that part of that process of keeping kids safe at Word of Life was having check ins before church for 30 minutes once a month. And 45 people responded, yes, I will. Two months later, less than 10 people are on the list. People are busy. People have stuff going on. The vast majority of them just won't answer a text message or a phone call. Just kind of blew it off. Again, if you're one of those, I don't even know who's on the list. So I'm not mad at you. I'm not trying to judge you or make you feel guilty. If you feel guilty, maybe it's the Holy Spirit. Just saying. But this isn't just a problem here. This is a problem everywhere. You see, the enemy has done something the last year that we have never faced in our lifetime and really hasn't been faced in generations in this country. We've been, we've been put in this place where all of our routines, where all of our normal ways of living have been completely shut down or altered in very difficult ways. And we've been told that it's better to isolate from one another. It's better to just get focused inward. Because really, what is all of, all of the, the stuff that's being pushed right now? What is it telling you to do? Care about you. Care about you. Care about you. Care about you. Protect you. Protect you. Protect you. Protect you. Protect you. Think of yourself. Think of yourself. Think of yourself. Think of yourself. And this is where we're at. We've been lulled into a place of complacency and apathy about life because we're so afraid of living. Because if we take a step out the door and we actually begin to live, we might die. Do you know what Paul said? To live is Christ, to die is gain. You know what? If I die today, 
because I'm serving Jesus and I'm living for the kingdom? Sign me up! Because I'm going somewhere much better than this. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a sadist. I'm not trying to walk out in front of a bus. I'm not thinking about death. I don't want to die. I, I want to raise my kids. I want to see them graduate. I want to beat up their future husbands. Like, I want to I do all that stuff that every dad dreams about doing. But if I get taken out because I'm simply living for Jesus, that's not a problem. Because I'm going somewhere better. In Matthew 5, 37, Jesus said, you know, just a simple yes, I will, or no, I won't will suffice. Anything beyond that comes from the evil one. The problem for us, though, is that our yes doesn't really mean anything anymore because we say yes as Christians because we know what the words are that we're supposed to say. We're supposed to want to serve the Lord. We're supposed to want to live for him. We're supposed to want to do good things in the church and in our lives. So we can put the smile on and the mask on and we can get it out there. But of course I'll do that. Yes, I want to serve. And we know how easy it is to blow it off and to pretend like nothing happened. Because today, even though we're more able to be connected, we're more disconnected than ever. Because we hide from each other through not answering phone calls and text messages. And then we just don't show up to church. Problem solved. Except that, what are you trading your soul for? What, are, what would you give in exchange for your soul? Convenience? Comfort? Just, just a season? And by the way, if you need a season of rest in your life, if you're going through difficulty, we want to walk through that with you. We want to help you to heal. There's, nothing, there's no shame in that. But just tell us. Don't just ghost us. That's not kingdom behavior. We're supposed to walk with life, walk, walk with each other through life, not avoid each other on our way to death. Does that make sense? Right now, I've got a group of people, and they're going to uh, they're going to pass out some things. You guys have your your baskets to pass out. Go ahead and grab those. Oh, by the way, there's two right there, Robin Donna. Will you start passing those out? Um, Boys and girls, boys and girls, I don't want you to get distracted in class, okay? So when you get it, please hold your hand, then I'll tell you what to do with it, okay? Don't get distracted by this, all right? Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 21, 31b. Then Jesus, guys want to hear this, then Jesus explained his meaning of the story. I tell you the truth. Corrupt tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you do. For John the Baptist came and showed you the right way to live, but you did not believe him. While tax collectors and prostitutes did. And even when you saw this happening, you refused to believe him and repent of your sins. You guys know what this is? Everybody got theirs? This is a finger trap, okay? Okay. Now, the way you work one of these bad boys, I want you to stick your fingers in there. Yes. Got it in there? Got it. Now, I want you to pull your fingers apart. What happens when you pull your fingers apart? Trapped. They get trapped, right? Guys, I cannot show you a better demonstration of what happens when we try to pull away from God's will. When your fingers are together, you can pull your finger out, no problem. What happens when you try to pull your fingers apart? You get trapped, right? Right? You get trapped. This is a representation of your relationship with Jesus this morning. If you stay close to him, you can move around freely. But if you try to get away from God's will, you're going to get stuck. And the harder you pull away from God's will, the harder you're going to get stuck. The more you're going to be trapped in your own will. And what happens if you pull hard enough? This was two cents. You break the relationship. So Jesus says, the sinners are getting into heaven ahead of you religious folks because they figured it out. They understand that there's a right way to live and they have submitted themselves to it. But you religious people you think you've got it all figured out on your own. You don't think you need God. You think your way is better than his way. And you will not believe. What is belief? 
Belief is faith. What is faith? If you strip down faith, which is the center of Christianity, it's the center of our relationship with God. If you strip down faith to its most basic essence, faith is absolute trust in God's goodness. They refused to believe that God was good and better than them. That God's plan was better than their plan. And then he goes on to say, you know what, you even saw this happening. And here's what I think he means. There was a time in your life where you bought into the way of God. And you even started doing it yourself. We see this happen all the time, right? People come into the church. The Holy Spirit speaks to them. They offer their life to Jesus and salvation. And they start buying into the ways of the kingdom. And all of a sudden... Marriages start getting better. Relationships with children start getting healed. Finances start coming into order. And baggage starts getting left in the past instead of carried along. And that person starts getting better and healthier and starting to change. But then, I don't know what happens. COVID happens. Maybe unexpected death happens. Maybe a loss of a job or maybe too much overtime. But whatever it is, something comes along and it begins to disrupt that relationship. And because of that disruption, the person begins to look at their plans again. They start looking at that exit, that trap door that they've allowed to stay open. And then they slip back through it and they go right back to the way that they were. You've seen this work, but yet you have refused to believe. It's not simply that you don't believe it. You refuse to believe it. You know it's right, but you will not allow yourself to accept that it's right because you're too concerned with you. You want what's good right now. You want to feel good right now. You want to be happy right this second. So you're just going to stay at home and you're going to do you. That's the dumbest statement I've ever heard in my life. Do you? Aren't you glad Jesus didn't just do Jesus? You know what that would have looked like? That would have looked like Jesus staying in heaven and just being with the Father and all of us going to hell. We're not called to do us. We're called to do the kingdom. In Mark chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus asks, what do you mean if I can? Anything is possible for the person who believes. Yes, submitting your will to God is going to be hard going to be the hardest thing you've ever done in your life, but guess what? You're not doing it on your own. You're doing it by the power of the Holy Spirit. And if you truly believe that God is good, then you know that his way is going to be better than your way, and you're going to submit to that, and the Holy Spirit's going to help you to do so, and then anything will be possible. Psalm chapter 37, verse 4. So up to this point, we've talked a lot about why we should submit to God. We've talked a lot about how we should submit to God, but now I want to tell you what happens if you do submit to God. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desires. If you delight in Jesus, if you make Jesus your focus, and if you truly believe he is who he says that he is, and you buy into Jesus, guess what? Your will and God's will are going to come into alignment. And if your will and God's will come into alignment, God will give you anything you ask. Did you know that? That's a promise of God. Does God ever lie? No. If you will get your will into alignment with the Father's, he will give you every single thing you ask. But if you keep your will aside for yourself and you do things your way, many of your prayers aren't going to get answered. And then you're going to walk around like a lot of Christians complaining about God, wondering why things aren't going the way you want them to, and the reason that they're not going the way you want them to is because if they did, they would destroy you. God has a better way. God has a better plan. He wants to do good for you. Here's our last verse for this morning. Psalm 32, 8 through 11. The Lord says, I will guide you along the best path. Would you say best path? This is God's promise to you this morning. I will guide you along the best path for your life. I will give you advice and I will watch over you. <laughs> you ready for this part? Do not be like a senseless horse or mule that needs 
a bit and a bridle to keep it under control. Many sorrows come to the wicked, but unfailing love surrounds those who trust the Lord. So rejoice in the Lord and be glad, all you who obey him, all of you who submit your will to him. Shout for joy, all you whose hearts are pure. Would you bow your heads this morning? The first and most important part of submitting our will to the Father is accepting that we need to be saved, that we need Jesus to save us of our sins. If you're in that place this morning, you say, I need to be saved. I need to be forgiven. I need to get my will in alignment with the Father. Would you raise your hand this morning? I see lots of hands going up, okay? Now here's the second part of this. That was really for like the first timers, okay? But you don't have to raise your hand again. But if you're here this morning and there's an area of your life or maybe your whole life right now is out of alignment with the Father, you can get it on track right now. Our prayer team's coming. They're going to be up here at the front. And we're going to sing a song of response to the Lord because the Holy Spirit is speaking to you this morning. I know that He is. So in just a second, we're going to rise to our feet and we are going to pray. If we can pray with you this morning about your will and God's will, if you're ready to give your life and surrender and ask Jesus to save you, then I want to invite you up front. And these